Welcome back, everyone. We'll go ahead and uh, get started with our uh, third and final panel panel session of the day. Uh, this one's on the governance. So basically the uh, the policy and guidelines that the uh, aviation weather research and operations uh, communities uh, must adhere to to and follow and uh, and how those uh, you know, the, uh, policies may change in the future. Um, so we've got a uh, well, one of our panelists is uh, not able to make it today. So uh, uh, we've only got uh, two panelists for this one. So uh, probably more more time for questions and answers. So uh, uh, please get those in. Our uh, first panelist of the day is or the uh, of the session is uh, Gordy Rother. Uh, Gordy works for uh, Flight Standards, the uh, Air Carrier Operations Branch. Uh, supporting aviation weather policy and procedures. Um, he's the uh, uh, flight standards aviation uh, weather uh, subject matter expert, uh, working with uh, air traffic, NOAA, weather service, and uh, and others on uh, weather related issues. And uh, so, Gordy, I will uh, go ahead and pass it over to you and give me just a minute to bring up your slides. Thanks, Randy. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. OK, yeah, uh, I won't turn my camera on because I have a little a tablet that gets all funky on me when I use a little camera on it. So had some issues with that, but uh, I appreciate that uh, introduction. And yeah, I work in aviation. Uh, I'm an aviation safety inspector. I work in uh, uh, AFS 200 uh, where the air carrier operations branch, uh, but I'm one of uh, many inspectors that, uh, that deal with weather and the uh, flight standards side. Uh, first slide there, second slide, please. So I'm going to cover the roles and responsibilities and kind of what we're um, what we're doing today. Um, basically, to start off with, our roles and responsibilities are uh, cover three three big areas: uh, general aviation, which is our AFS 800 partners. Uh, they have the FAST team, that's a team that goes out and uh, does outreach uh, to the to the uh, aviation community at large. Uh, a lot of good stuff comes out of the FAST team. They work a lot with uh, AOPA and others. Um, they published the pre-flight planning guidance. Uh, recently, there was a AC um, updated on that. Marilyn Pearson, uh, who no longer is with the FA, but she's on here, was uh, instrumental in getting that uh, up, up and running and published, but that's an AFS 800 document. Like I said, I'm in AFS 200. Uh, there's a few of us in 200 that work on the 121 and 135, which is uh, the big air carriers and the uh, uh, on-demand folks. Uh, we um, deal with the policies, uh, regulation, and uh, interface a lot with, uh, uh, with AGC, which is our legal counsel. Uh, AFS 400 uh, is uh, John Steventon and his group over there. Um, they deal with uh, a lot of the guidance, a lot of the uh, advisory circular guidance that's out there. Um, they put together requirements. They have uh, some uh, some money that they use for weather research. Uh, so they have some weather research products that they work with uh, ANGC6. And um, they also uh, deal with, um, they're putting together our, our aviation weather handbook. So that's... Um, so the technical uh, programs are run through 400. So that's uh, that's how they handle things. Next slide, please. So just uh, basically on some of the regulations, um, uh, 91 um, just requires pilots to be uh, familiar with weather information. There's no specific uh, requirements under IFR that talks about having having uh, appropriate weather reports uh, and forecasts. Um, next slide, please. Under 121 um, certificate holders conducting domestic and flag. They have to have the uh, appropriate weather reporting um, and forecast necessary for the operation. And specifically, uh, the sources of information uh, within the 48 have to be a source uh, prepared by the Weather Service or approved by the Weather Service. And for operations outside the 48, uh, is uh, prepared by a source approved. Uh, by the administrator. So the FAA has uh, some authority there. On the 135 side, next slide, please. So 135 operations. Uh, interesting thing about 135 is, and, and some of you probably are interested in this, is uh, a lot of the uh, 
uh, UAS operators and uh, in the future AAM, will, a lot of it will fall under 135. So we're trying to figure out how this is all going to work. Um, but uh, for 135, um, again, it's similar to 121 where that has to be a National Weather Service or source approved by the National Weather Service. And that's a requirement for operations under IFR. Uh, for under VFR, um, they can operate if they have missing weather reports, uh, the pilot can make that uh, that determination. Um, but generally speaking, the uh, uh, weather service or a source approved by the administrator is uh, is allowed for 135 operations. Next slide, please. Uh, so what do we do if we uh, we coordinate uh, aviation weather um, requirements? So any new requirements are are worked through uh, ANGC six. Uh, I think uh, Bill didn't use the word requirement. Uh, recommendations, I think, is what the term he was using. But uh, you know, when we look, when we find issues and um, you know we we make recommendations, we work it through ANGC six. Uh, we have biweekly meetings with uh, NGC-6 flight standards and others within flight services uh, within the FAA. And we have monthly meetings with the FAA and the Weather Service. Uh, so that's a, an effort to continue the coordination. Uh, next slide. So uh, future guidance. So the FAA uh, has recognized that our current certified weather systems, they're just too costly to obtain and maintain, and there's significant gaps out there. And we realize that aviation is expanding beyond airports. So how can we fill this and, and what will be good enough to fill this? So we're currently looking at uh, developing uh, uh, different standards for what we call analyzed weather or it's weather information not, not provided by an AWAS or ASOS or, or certified observer. But the silver standard recognizes the fact that, uh, you know, um, there's, there's certain risks uh, that that are acceptable, um, you know, uh, lower risk uh, operations, uh, rural remote operations, some some could be even higher risk. So this the silver standard will be a, what we're looking at is working in an advisory circular as to how third party weather vendors and and really uh, FAA can basically quantify how good does the weather information have to be to kind of fill those gaps. Uh, we're not we're not planning on lowering the bar for anything that we currently have with uh, you know category one, two, and three operations, those types of lower lower operations. Um, but uh, we certainly recognize the fact that we've got to uh, expand our horizons here. Uh, we know that uh, there are less expensive systems and sources of information out there. A lot of it is going to come from the commercial weather information providers. Uh, many of them are on this call listening in. Uh, the National Weather Service has products that we currently not, aren't using, uh, but we are evaluating and we have a, through AFS 400 funding, we have a, a working group with the Environmental Modeling Center looking at uh, how good RTMA is. And uh, so that that's a, that's a potential um, uh, analyzed product that would uh, fill some of the gaps, if you will. Uh, the handbook development, I kind of talked about that. There's six advisory circulars. Uh, it's going to be combined into a weather handbook. The nice thing about this, it'll allow for more timely updates and it'll be easier access to guidance. Uh, we're planning to make it uh, available via the, the web. It'll be easier to search uh, and things like that. And we realize that a lot of these advisory circulars are used by academia, um, you know, by, by pilots, uh, you know, learning and and it's quite often we're we're behind the power curve as things advance advance very quickly in the uh, in the weather uh, reporting and forecasting world. So we've got to we've got to try to keep up. And a handbook will make it a lot easier for us to amend that that product. So um, just basically, um, you know, flight standards were the ones that are, are that are interface uh, directly with the pilot. Obviously, we do the certification of the airmen, certification of the operators, and um, you know we're the ones that uh, that have to write the policy, you know, for what's what's good enough. So, um, kind of where a little bit of the rubber meets the road. Um, definitely uh, a, a lot of the face for the uh, for the FAA when when pilots come to the FISDOs 
And so, um, you know, we, we hope to make our policies clear uh, and uh, the information easy to use. So that's kind of the what, what our roles are. Uh, with that, I don't have anything else to talk about here. Um, if anybody <clears> has any <throat> questions, please, uh, please let me know. I'll turn it back to you, Randy. All right. Thanks, Gordy. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Bruce Entwistle from uh, NOAA. Uh, Bruce is in his fourth year serving as a chief of the Aviation and Space Weather Services branch at the uh, National Weather Service headquarters. Um, and prior to that assignment, he served uh, uh, 13 years at uh, AWC. So, Bruce, hold on just a minute. And I'll get your uh, slides up here, but you can go ahead and start. Uh, you don't have any slides for me, so oh, I don't, you have, don't any have anything slides. to worry about. Oh. Yeah, and um, uh, thanks for hanging in for the dry topic of requirements as it deals with uh, operations to research. For us, um, I work primarily on the requirements or recommendations receipt side of the house. And the governance process here, uh, if it was a creature, its ears would perk up the moment it hears somebody saying, hey, I've got an idea. That idea can come from international through, uh, you know, the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO. Most of the aviation related O to R comes through uh, Bill Bauman's shop, ANGC6 with Pat Murphy's branch sending the recommendations over to us. Once they arrive here, and usually those recommendations are, a, the Weather Service is aware of, in addition to those monthly meetings that Gordy talked about earlier, there's other forums that the Weather Service participates in with the FAA. And there's a lot of close collaboration that goes on between uh, Joshua Sheck's support branch there at the Aviation Weather Center and the people with the, uh, you know, the weather algorithms and other ideas that come over for operationalization within weather service uh, pages, either through aviationweather.gov or for incorporation into our numerical weather prediction, our weather models here. When those recommendations, when we get those to coming in from uh, ANGC6, those immediately go up to a committee here at the Weather Service, and they have to take everything that comes in from the FAA. Uh, we also get recommendations from the National Transportation Safety Board that deal with aviation. And they have to figure out how to most cost effectively with the taxpayers' dollars, figure out how to implement various requirements from aviation and from the various other types of forecasting. You know, there's space weather in my branch, for example, but you name the type of weather forecasting, whether it's marine, tropical, uh, public weather forecasting, winter, fire, severe storms, even climate, those are all contending for a limited bucket of resources to be run operationally within the National Weather Service. So that first committee gets all the recommendations and requirements and they rack and stack them and pass them over to another committee who's working on, okay, what are the solutions? Now, since a lot of the times, working in research to operations with aviation, solutions are already in progress. And so what my branch tries to do as the requirements are coming in, we try to have a similar level of awareness happening on the folks that provide the solutions. And we hope that they both come up and reach these two committees at the same time. Um, somebody might ask, well, isn't there a specific line for aviation operations at the Weather Service? The answer is no. Uh, our budget doesn't align that way. We're actually broken up into different, what they call portfolios, and each one has a specific function. So for example, you know, we've got observations. So we have a portfolio dedicated to observations. We have a portfolio dedicated to central processing. It's just where our supercomputers that run the models live. We have a portfolio dedicated to dissemination. We got to move all that data from here to there in a cost efficient and speedy manner. We also have uh, 
my branch, which is called Analyze Forecast and Support. That's where all the various products and statements and things that you hear uh, about the weather, even the terminal aerodrome forecast, the TAFs, your airmets, your SIGMETs, all come from that portion of the portfolio. And then there's actually a group that focuses on research to operations, which we call science and technology integration. And so working all those portfolios together within our governments determines what we can actually get to the public or to aviators, anybody, whether it's somebody flying general aviation or you know, you're a freight hauler or if you're into major passenger cargo ops or even if you're into charter operations. And so all of that has to come together in order for the weather service to say, hey, this is what you're going to get. Now, the folks at AWC have done a wonderful job of integrating a lot of the new things coming in and filtering out and phasing out some of the older products that really have better solutions than what have been out there in the past. And so there's a lot of back and forth that goes between uh, the operating side of the weather service, the algorithm production side of the weather service and the requirement side there, along with our partners over at the Federal Aviation Administration. And to a little lesser extent with the NTSB, um, any interaction with the Civil Aviation, or, uh, yeah, the international group, you know, that's through the FAA. They provide the international recommendations come through the FAA and then to us. It doesn't go straight from international to the U.S. Another thing that we also handle, because not all things wanting to be operationalized happens to be uh, research, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a few folks who have listened to us like, you know, I would really like a TAF for my airport. And so we can help with that part too. Um, and it tends to generate some other requests, but if you, those typically would start at the local forecast office, but you know, a lot of times people don't know which forecast office would actually have responsibility for a particular airport. And we can help identify that and begin working the process that way. And with that, I will clam up and uh, entertain questions. All right. Uh, thanks, Bruce. And thanks, Gordy. And uh, we'll now open it up to questions. So I'll uh, pass it over to Dave Strand. All right, and uh, so far we don't have any specific questions. It's been a lot of good discussion uh, about uh, <clears throat> O2R. Bill Bauman had uh, some comments, and let's see. Yeah, he had a couple things. Bill, do you want to expand on what you were putting in the chat there and um, kind of tee off the... Um, discussion here because uh, otherwise there's no specific questions that have come in yet. What was I putting in the chat in response to this session? Uh, well, it's about promoting a O2R, your O2R. aviation has a request form, your um, um, talking about the community of interest. Um, let's see here. There's another one earlier. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, that's uh, okay. I'll just, um, you know, stop all your funding for putting me on the spot. <laughs> just kidding, of course. No, that, I mean, actually, the actually, you, did, you did talk about, uh, um, you know, the, the, the difference between the terms requirements and recommendations. Which right. Yeah, Matt had asked know, that question, um, which was from the, the previous session or, or something he just wanted to discuss and that is kind of a um, an interesting topic because a lot of folks assume that the FAA levies requirements on the National Weather Service and as I put in the chat um, domestic aviation is supported by title 49 of the US code section 44 something or another and it's very um, specific verbiage that says the administrator of the FAA, which obviously the administrator doesn't do this, but through my division and through Pat Murphy's branch, we make recommendations to the Secretary of Commerce, which of course is Bruce's branch. We don't do it to the Secretary of Commerce on providing met services necessary for safe and efficient movement of aircraft in commerce. So we're making recommendations. 
And then to promote that safety and efficiency to the highest possible degree, the Secretary of Commerce or National Weather Service shall, and there's a whole list of things that they shall do, but one of those is not necessarily fulfill that requirement. The way the verbiage reads is they'll do their best to meet those requests or those recommendations. And as Bruce was saying, aviation is not specifically budgeted within weather service to meet those recommendations. So that gets dumped in with marine and fire weather and tropical and public weather, and they have to vie for resources to provide that support. Now there's one difference there, which is Randy's program, which is Aviation Weather Research Program. We specifically set aside FAA funding under research and development funding to fund the transition of the AWRP technologies to the National Weather Service. So we provide that funding. But for other recommendations that are not specific to that research, the FAA is not providing the funding. So the Weather Service is doing that and they have to vie for those, those different levels of funding. So that's where that term requirements versus recommendation versus request comes in. And we are not levying requirements on the Weather Service. They're recommendations that they try to support. Uh, Bruce, from your side, I don't, since Dave put me on the spot, I'll put you on the spot. Did you want to say anything on the response to those? I know you mentioned that you know you have the governance and you have committees. Uh, if there's anything to follow up on. No, um, you you send over the requirements to my branch, and we uh, uh, elaborate no, requirements, recommendations. <laughs> Recommendation is a much harder word to pronounce for some it reason. Um, <laughs> so, and you know, my branch speaks requirements all the times, but yes, technically they are recommendations. But we engage in communications within the Weather Service and then provide feedback to Bill Bauman's group there at the Aviation Weather Division as to what we are capable of doing. Can we do some of it, all of it, none of it? What kind of timeline is involved? And then, you know, once there's some level of agreement, in there, then uh, obviously uh, dollars have to be talked about at some point, either from weather service appropriated funds for the operations and maintenance of a feature, a thing, or a forecast, or how do we pay for this transition from an operational si or from a research system into a weather service operation system? And the other part of that process is we don't just throw something over to Bruce and say, hey, here you go, please fulfill this. We try to give a couple of years notice if we can to get into the planning cycle for funding. Um, but we also iterate on what that recommendation is. So we start off by talking to each other. We have monthly meetings. We'll send a draft letter and say, hey, this is what we're thinking about recommending. What do you guys think? The Weather Service will hack on it and send it back and forth with us. So when we send our final recommendation letter or letter of request to the weather service we've all discussed it already to make sure that it goes into the system without coming back so there's a lot of work that goes into that that process it's not just throwing it over the fence um, and in this case you know we've all heard of the valley of death with research to operations this is a valley of death or could be for requests for operations we, we don't throw it over we iterate on it and it's it's not you know, it's a frequent occurrence to have four or five different iterations of these conversations in order to one, uh, make sure that we actually understand what's being requested. Uh, a word at the FAA will mean something completely different in the weather service. And I don't know how many aha moments we've had over that in the last few years. So yeah, we, we a lot of time we spend just learning how to talk with each other, talk to each other and, you know, just understand so that when we say something, the same picture shows up in our head. It makes no sense for the Weather Service to implement something and have the FAA come back and says, that's not what we wanted. Yep, precisely. Good points. Uh, you know, Dave, uh, you had mentioned the, uh, the O2R. Did you want me to speak to that or did you have something else? Well, you know, before you leave the uh, requirements sure. recommendation session, uh, Josh Malloy put in a, a, a question with levying requirements in lieu of recommendations on the weather service have more pull in helping the national weather service get the needed appropriations to fulfill those requirements or recommendations. So I guess that was, you know, probably at either one of y'all there. 
for both of you. Life in a government agency is always about having to figure out how many requirements you can fulfill with the appropriation with the money that you've got. And you know, I mean, things that come from ICAO, you know, those are requirements. I mean, they get filtered through Bill's shop to us, but we and we do have to rank that much higher than some of these other things that come through. But the language for people who parse words for a living, aka lawyers, um, they pay attention to that phrase in the US code that says recommendations. And that's when the word parsers really start getting into our, uh, our gills. Um, and I see, uh, you know, le levying a requirement versus a recommendation uh, really, it can help a little bit, but because, you know, aviation doesn't have a specific line item unless somebody wants to get rid of aviation R to O. We don't want to go there. We just did four years of that. Um, so um, I'm not sure how much traction that gets by changing the word. Yeah, I agree. I don't know if the word would, would matter that much. And I suspect that somebody's thought that through when the US code was written and they made it more, they made it a recommendation so that you're not putting somebody up against the wall who doesn't have the resources to do it. Now, could that be something appropriated by Congress? I guess that would be something that could be looked into where you do have an aviation line, like Bruce was saying, then you could certainly have a requirement knowing you have funding for it, but without that specific funding, that resource that has to be shared across the weather service, you know, it really has to be a recommendation, I would think. Yeah. And we do use those recommendations when we put our uh, budget request, our in the blue book as it's called on the NOAA side, that goes out before Congress. And so those requests, those requirements, those timelines are all taken into consideration. But you know, once it once I get that put together and it goes up through what the equivalent of our Congressional Affairs Office, it, you know, what happens with the sausage as it gets made at the higher levels beyond my branch is a bit opaque to me right now, but you know, it it's helped in the past. Um, we'll see if it's going to help in the future. All we can do is the best that we can. Um, there's more stuff coming down the pike. And, you know, we also have to work within various other parts of the weather service and their cycles for implementation and adaptation. And there are some, there are times when some parts of the weather service due to um, major hardware upgrades simply can't put something new in. And so we have to work with those cycles too. And that, you know, and our, our lead time for new stuff coming in can be as short as two years. I've seen some instances where it can go six or nine, just depending on the type of requirement. Kind of on that same uh, vein of requirements, uh, Matthias asked, to what extent are the various requirements coming to NOAA visible to the agency submitting them? And it gives for an example, is the FAA aware of what uh, surface transportation may have submitted? And are there perhaps overlapping uh, overlaps in the interest to joint forces for a common solution? I think the answer is no. I don't think there's any um, knowledge of what other agencies may be submitting to NOAA, at least not that I, I'm aware of. Um, you know, we're pretty, gosh, I hate to say it, but we're, we're in our own cone of aviation and not looking out at what other agencies may be submitting for their support. I would hope NOAA does that internally to extend, as I mentioned to her, was funded by FAA, and there are a lot of agencies that benefit from the HER. We were focused on the, the aviation impact variables, like a better icing forecast, but I'm sure there's been other developments in the HER submitted by other um, lines of business within weather service or for those for fire weather or whatnot that were then expanded within the HER. So maybe indirectly, Matthias, but I don't know of any direct discussion or sharing of that information. Thanks, Bill. And in some ways, this could also be a discussion that may be revisited uh, on 
Wednesday when we talk about other potential areas that may benefit aviation and vice versa. Great. Well, I think that was it on the requirements uh, discussion it looked like that was going on. There was a, um, let's see here. You mentioned, Dave, the, the O2R. Yes. And one thing I did want to expand on on that, which I didn't uh, dur during the previous session, I mentioned our community of interest, <clears throat> and um, that's a, a formal organization within the FAA. And there's only a couple, three of them, I think. Weather is one that we started um, about 18 months ago, the day before the pandemic shut us down. And um, we, we take problem statements from stakeholders. It's the members are FAA employees. There's about 40 of them. And we have a, a core team of four people, myself, Alfred Muscanian from the operations side of FAA, where I'm, I'm on the research side. And then, of course, Dave Strand here and, and Matt Franzak are part of our core team that support us. And those problem statements are, were all generated. We had, what, Dave, 37 initially, I think, right. were um, pretty much from the operators saying, we've got a problem here, how can you help? So we were hearing directly from the operational community within the FAA of weather issues that they were looking to solve. And that community of interest, the primary focus is really to communicate across the agency. So you have your silos of excellence where my research arm might not be talking to Alfred's operations arm and we're either duplicating effort, wasting taxpayers' money, or going off in different directions. So the community of interest brings that together. And then, as I said, with Dave, Matt, Alfred, and myself, the core team works with those 40 employees and we meet every month and discuss our problem statements and look for solutions. Um, we do have our weather portal, as Dave had alluded to, and I put the URL there in the chat, where any stakeholder that's operating in the national airspace system can submit a problem statement to us. And we will consider that. That goes direct to our requirements branch, to Pat Murphy and his folks, and we'll consider whether or not that would be a valid requirement that either we work internally at the FAA or maybe something that Weather Service could support. And we go through aviation weather research program or, or weather technology in the cockpit to provide a solution to those stakeholders. And then I mentioned we meet with uh, A4A and DAOPA and other uh, organizations representing the airlines and other groups to submit their requirements. So those are all the operators sending us their, their needs and their problems for things that we could potentially work on. You know, I have, I, I was not smirking at you. If you saw me smirking, I was looking at the comment that came in because this is scarily the case so many times. Matt and I are on the same uh, brain wavelengths here. And because um, I was thinking when this discussion about the COI and then about, well, more specifically about cross visibility uh, of, of weather requirements uh, across other agencies. And if there was that visibility, I thought, gee, we almost need like a macro COI you know, that, that is looking uh, across all the agencies. So well, Matt have in the chat. Uh, that's called ICAMS, Dave. Well, well, and that's and that's what Matt, and I was thinking, I thought, gee, I wonder if ICAMS would be maybe, uh, you know, that. And so he says, I wonder if the question of visibility to other agencies requests of NOAA uh, is something that ICAMS, OFCM, could, should explicitly do. And then uh, Matthias kind of wanted to know if there was equivalence to the FAA's COI in other governmental agencies that um, anybody was aware of. So all kind of related to that um, uh, in interagency or cross agency um, between agencies visibility. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at ICAMS as sort of that macro, but they're not really operating the same way we are where we're looking at specific mm -hmm problem statements, ICAMS is much more of a broad view of the federal um, weather enterprise and how are they working together. And that's one of the things I've tried to footstop <clears throat> from what we've learned in our community interest is I'm trying to convince, I, I work on the Committee for Services within ICAMS, is to look at problems because they're looking more at 
issues, which is different. Mm -hmm. And they're very broad things like we want to provide better weather information to underserved communities. Well, tell me the problem and then we can maybe figure out what we're doing there, not just a broad statement like that. And some of that's response to the Weather Act. Um, there's just stuff in there that they need to respond to. But I think the larger the organization, the harder it is to get down to those details like we've been successful with Dave and Matt um, in the community of interest. I don't know about other organizations in the federal government if they have that type of COI thing. It was unique to me um, in the FAA because when it was first proposed to me, I thought it was silly and found out I was very wrong. And it, it's very valuable to have that communication among people with like-mindedness. One of my division colleagues, she's looking at starting a human factors community of interest and has asked me for information on how we're doing ours. So, um, you know, I don't know in, in like weather service, could you have an aviation community of interest? Because you, Bruce, you have 11 different mission areas. Well, I assume they probably work together anyway. Fire weather people work with fire weather people and so on, but you know, do they have a formal community like the FAA? I, I, I don't know, Matthias. Yeah, and I don't know either. I mean, we do find pockets of other agencies where weather is a piece of information into the larger mission. Uh, we see it uh, in the Department of Interior and with the Forest Service at the Department of Agriculture dealing with fire weather. Uh, we see it in some of the state agencies with some of their uh, hazard response missions and various environmental programs. Uh, you'll see it at the EPA. You know, that's a completely different group and weather, you know, is just another piece of information into a much larger operation. But whether they have something exactly similar or parallel to the FAA's uh, weather community of interest? I do not know. Um, one thing that, uh, well, I tell you just kind of uh, briefly, is there any other um, discussion on this? Because there's a pretty good string of questions, discussion on um, uh, on Gordy's topic there and ACs and so forth. So um, we can circle a, back to this, but. Oh, I had a quick comment. I'm just thinking about the discussion um, on the communities. And, and, you know, while with the HER, there's some leveraging with severe weather, um, even some renewable energy and whatnot. The, the aviation support, as is, is Bill mentioned, has really been key and essential. And I, I think about what. I think one of the things, you know, going back even to the late, like 2008, 2010, initial work on, on, on the HER before we had storm scale operational modeling and the support from the FAA for that. And I think one of the things is it crosses a lot of different weather hazards, you know, and so it really, it's, it's not just a single focus, you know, everything from winter weather and icing and into and, and the convection, of course, and, and clouds. And so, it is a pretty unique group and, and and the support provided for the her i think has been really essential to, to to move it forward and so it's been helpful just to think a little bit about that thanks steve and um brian pedigree did uh just in our comment that in his days uh, until recently at awc there was a beginning conversation about cross interest between aviation and fire weather support with some sort of research groups. Um. Yeah, um, unfortunately, I'm not part of that conversation, but I can, you know, I, I am aware that when multiple programs come together to support a particular recommendation or requirement, it does get a little more heft in those decision making councils. You know, it's always nice to have friends in the council room. So that doesn't surprise me. Um, I do see a lot of parallels between aviation and fire, aviation and our severe weather programs, aviation and our winter weather programs. And we are, at least within my organization, uh, looking at those things, uh, uh, what I would call topics of mutual need, so that uh, you know we can buddy up and support each other on some of these 
uh, initiatives and recommendations and requirements that come in and our governance process when stuff comes in say elsewhere within the weather service invites our other service programs to comment on the requirement as it's being developed and vetted. I see uh, Joshua Sheck has responded to Brian's question. Yeah, Bruce, uh, uh, this is definitely your panel and, and you're dead on. I'm just, uh, it, it's, it, it is a conversation, but it, it, in scope it's huge and in, uh, in purity or in concentration, it's, it's very diluted. So I, I don't know that, that we've zeroed in on anything that we can do. We just keep getting paired with fire, maybe because everyone's worried about fire. Yeah, uh, let's just say in the meetings here at our headquarters, um, it's fire first, winter second. So <laughs> um, well, we'll see what happens yeah. after the 1st of January when our big uh, winter weather supporter moves on to uh, whiter pastures. Hey, this is Randy. We actually tried to get some uh, uh, fire weather folks, uh, especially for the uh, session on Wednesday. And unfortunately, because of all the fires going on, they just didn't have the bandwidth to do it. Well, Randy, uh, with your permission, uh, looking at the comments here, uh, we can circle back to this if there's more that come in, but there's been quite a few that were kind of targeted more for authority um, that I'd like to pivot to so we don't change him or run out of time um and there was really kind of two veins the first one was uh, uh, a pretty uh singular question from josh malloy uh, to gordy about the um uh, silver standard uh and, and a, a certification of weather system is that perhaps uh it may be beyond the scope of this panel of discussion but couldn't certified weather systems that are deemed too costly to obtain or maintain be addressed through infrastructure appropriations. And then after that, uh, there's some discussion about in books and AC. So, um, Gordy, do you want to respond to Josh on that? Gordy, yeah. there. He can't. Muted. And he just messaged and said that he can't unmute. We know how to fix that, Gordy. You leave and come back. And I had a similar problem where I couldn't mute. Um, <laughs> and I had to leave and come back. So I, there's been that's about the fourth or fifth report of that we've had today. Well, well, Dave, this is Matt. Would it would it be uh, if if in fact uh, Gordy does um, uh, bail and then come back? Would it would it? Uh... I was glancing through these uh, discussions about the um, <clears throat> handbooks and AC to see if there was somebody else in the equation here. There was a question about uh, the new uh, weather uh, services and new aviation weather handbook. Uh, somebody was asking about when is that going to be out, and uh, John Stevenson responded that it was currently an FA legal review. Um, and let's see, that was for 40 there. Did you need me to answer anything on the handbook there, Dave? Hey, hey Dave, uh, Marilyn Pearson has her hand up. She may be able to provide some answers. You know, that's one thing about teams. When you see a hand up, there's a little circle and it says plus 87 and then it has a hand. So then you have to go searching. So thanks for identifying the, the handy there. Marilyn, good to hear from you. What was your, uh, because you had, I think you had a hand in some of uh, this AC stuff and so forth as well. So uh, over to you, Marilyn. Thanks, David. Yes, and good to see and talk to all of you. Um, 
I had a hand in AC 91-92, the weather one. I can't comment on John's handbook. He will, I'm sure. But there are a couple of questions about ACs and how do you publish them? What's the criteria? There's no specific criteria uh, for the weather AC that I had uh, that I wrote with many of the people who were on this call. Um, AOPA, several individuals, other organizations all wanted to know what's the legal impact of not having a briefing or what is a legal briefing and so after having that question enough times and the request for how do you comply with 91103 the pre-flight requirements especially now that the flight service phone system seems to be antiquated everyone's online it was just a need to explain what is the rule, what are the requirements, how do you best go about doing it. So uh, we wrote the AC, it was kind of a two year project. From within the FAA, it goes through whatever division you're in for review and approval, and then it goes to the document control board made up of all of the divisions, representatives from all the divisions within the FAA. It's reviewed, uh, commented on, and moved on, eventually goes through legal and comments from legal, corrections, edits, whatever, uh, and then to publication. So this was probably a two-year project start to finish. Uh, so that's flight standards. Now, I can't speak for air traffic or anyone else uh, doing ACs, but within flight standards, that's typically the process. There's a need. There's a team that wants to go ahead and, and start the writing of it, and then it goes through a review process uh, internally within the FAA, then to legal, then it does have external comments as well. Well, and, and Marilyn, not, not to put you on the spot here, uh, since you're wearing a different hat these days, but um, uh, unless we've got Gordy back, um, Randy had a uh, interesting question um that, that that i've you know over the years advisory circulars when i first started in aviation back shortly after Lindbergh, that it, it was advisory and, and and they've become much more um requirements uh over the years and randy's question was a little bit more about well about the process for getting an ac published which you just went through and the enforcement power they can carry and he was discussing it specifically about a few years ago, they were considering an AC uh, or similar order for procedures for closing ramps uh, because of lightning ramps. And there was a lot of um, uh, concern from uh, airline operators that have big ramps because the ACs meant they had to ab abide versus, quote, consider. Um, so I, I guess to the enforcement power that they carry, considering they are advisory uh, by name anyway. Uh, do you want to comment on that or do you? Um, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I can comment from not from the FAA, but because I was there 24 years until recently. Oh. So I re remember some things. Um, advisory in nature. They explain regulations. But in that explanation, if you are operating contrary to what the explanation of the regulation is, in fact, you're operating contrary to the regulation. An AC uh, doesn't have the power to require you to do anything. It's the regulation. So any compliance and enforcement would be regulatory in nature, not advisory circular in nature. They're, really don't confuse that because the advisory circular may have explained something that in fact the operator in question may have done contrary. Randy, does that give a little, a little bit more um, context? In the, in no, the yeah, system? that yeah, that definitely helps. Um, and I get, you know, like I said, we had just briefly considered it and before we even got anywhere, the uh, couple of airline reps said, no, don't, you know, don't do that because, you know, that forces us to do things. Um, but the, uh, her comment about the 
it, it just you know kind of informs or or explains the requirement and technically there is no requirement for ramp closure so in that respect you know a, an ac probably wasn't appropriate in the first place but uh but still that's good to know and and it's uh, uh certainly helps to know what the you know kind of what that process is for the uh, development of an ac and randy you might have thought about a safeo uh, safety advisory for operations which is kind of a notification if there's uh, an urgent matter that you want to inform about. It takes less time to publish a SAFO. Um, again, those are not requirements, but they advise of pertinent information of a timely fashion. Okay, thanks. And, and speaking of the timeliness of, of ACs, there was a uh, comment or comment earlier about the there was going to be I think it was maybe from Gordy discussion um, that was talking about that there was going to be about a half a dozen <clears throat> ACs that he was talking about were going to go into a handbook because that was easier and they could uh, keep that up to date more easily than uh, than the ACs. And, yeah. and I guess I can see that. I mean, the aim is updated every six months, and I guess I could see that knowing how long it takes, uh, it seems, for ACs to get updated. But um, is that, what is it that would make a handbook, I guess, administratively more easily updated than uh, ACs that have maybe the equivalent material in them? Legal review. Uh, it's legal review, so legal as yes, one, but not the other. And I know John Stevenson has his hand up, so it may be on the. John, is that on the same subject here? Yes, it is. The handbook is within 400, um, and uh, we have it with legal currently. It's made it, made it through the DCP process, so it's been reviewed and commented on and answered, and now it's with AGC legal for their review and comment as well. We've answered their comments and we've pushed them back to them, so we're close. Um, as soon as um, they get finished with that review uh, of our responses, uh, we should be into the next phase of publication. But I, I can't speak to their timeline, and uh, I have no influence over that at all. So I can't give you an exact date, but we're hoping it's soon. The, yeah, un unfortunately, everything now uh, goes through legal. Um, you know, the theory that the handbook will be easier to update is still a pretty good theory. Um, the challenge is. Uh, I mean, SAFOs, infos, everything that we write uh, has spends time in legal. And the bigger the document, the longer the longer they get to to review it. So some of these uh, some of these ACs are pretty lengthy. Uh, I have three currently working right now, and uh, you know they're they're they they literally take years um, to to get through the process. So it's um, it's not timely enough for us to keep up with uh, with everything that's going on in the aviation world. So the handbook is a better idea uh, if we can establish timelines like you're mentioning for the AIM um, that there'd be cutoff dates and, and uh, document ch change proposals will be put forth and it'll be easier to manage that way. Um, and we just have to work that process through with legal. So the big review, which is the, uh, the initial rewrite or the initial write of that, like, like John said, has already gone through. We've uh, adjudicate, adjudicated their comments and and spoken to their comments, and and now they're just chewing on the last little bits of it before we can go to publish publishing yeah. on the handbook. We had some ACs that were weren't reviewed or weren't re uh, revised or or added to for decades, like the hazardous mountain winds or pilot windshear guide. So we had a very thorough senior meteorological review from uh, Larry Birch over all those ACs and the, and the implementation into the single source document, the handbook. So this is it's as current as anything has been in, a, in a quite a while. So that's a that's a definite uh, benefit, and uh, we've made significant a lot of changes to it. So it's we're excited to get it out. We, we're hoping it's sooner than later. You know, there's nothing like administrative red tape to, to slow down progress uh, sometimes. So exactly, uh, I, I know uh, out of AFS 400 back in the 90s, I was working closely with uh, the guy that was doing RDSM, 
And RVSM, the guidance just needed it needed to get out so the manufacturers and OEMs could develop the uh, the service bulk of material to meet with the uh, ICAO uh, North Atlantic mandate. So because AC would take too long, it, they came out with an IGM-91 RVSM interim guidance material, and, and it was a you know a couple hundred page document, and eventually ended up in a advisory circular, but uh, it, it took years uh, beyond what was needed. So uh, we, we feel your pain when you're trying to get some of this stuff uh, out in a timely fashion. And, and Gloria, I'm glad you got your mute button is working again. Um, you're, you're not the first uh, to be approached upon that today. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard Marilyn's uh, discussion, which thank you, Marilyn, for uh, stepping in there, but if there's anything you wanted to add about um, the um, getting it as AC published in the timeline. Uh, yeah, that the, the, you know, like I, I saw Marilyn post, it's two years for sure. Uh, it's probably longer than that, the, the way things are going now, but it's, it is a, uh, you know, we, we, we have a specific format that we follow. We have a long form or a short form of the AC and, and it goes through our document control board, which is an informal coordination process of lines of business. And and then from there, once it's once it's finalized, it goes to legal, and and then and then it and then it then it goes through formal coordination, and through formal coordination, it can be changed again and again and again. So um, these are these, this is just the standard process for for getting uh, things published, and and the AC is really no different than publishing a notice, um, you know. So uh, this is this is the world we live in, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I will say that. You know, some ACs uh, have a regulatory hook. Um, I noticed there was a comment about that, whether they're required to follow the AC. Um, the way they're written, generally speaking, um, it, it, they say, you know, right up front, it's one way, but it's not the only way to meet the intent of the role. Um, take uh, ETOPS, for example, extended, uh, extended operations with a twin engine aircraft or extend operations now. That is, there's a regulation. And and so an ETOPS AC um, has specific guidance in there. Well, when we do the review of the operators, you know, uh, uh, their 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 proposal, their policies and procedures, we make sure it's in compliance with the AC. And and that's an effort to standardize things. So one operator's uh, you know doesn't doesn't operate differently than another. Uh, but that's one of the general reasons we like to write those is. That is it provides standardization. So is something like uh, the SAFO was mentioned earlier, which I remember seeing uh, uh, those coming down the pipe when I was in management. But um, is that, uh, it, it sounds like it's, it's a much uh, more easily generated uh, and disseminated thing from a timeliness standpoint, but does it, like the example that was used was the lightning on the ramp. If a SAFO comes out, how binding uh, does that um, like well, the ABC can point back to uh, a reg or something? So would that have any less um, concern about, uh, you know, tying the hands of uh, uh, ramp operators for uh, hubs? It, it becomes a liability for them, to be quite honest with you, with especially with their insurance carriers. I, I can tell you that SAFOs are not are not regulatory. I, I've written a number of SAFOs on wet and contaminated runways, and we've seen operators just disregard that information and continue operations and have accidents. And And so the question has come back even from the NTSB whether whether these things should be regulatory or not. The challenge is, is you'd, li you'd like to fix the regulation, but that 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 isn't even a, a, a starter in a lot of cases. And, and if you look at our regulations with re with regard to weather, they are ancient. I mean, in fact, the the Weather Bureau is still written in the in 121 regulations. I mean, um, you know, so it, they don't even call them National Weather Service source approved by the Weather Bureau. So it really it's really dated. Um, but it's a very big challenge to make to make a regulatory change. Um, so you know, the the best thing we can do is to try to get the information out, and that is through a SAFO or an info. And we've written a, we've written a number of infos on uh, on weather. In fact, we've got one going on right now for the snow specie change, and that'll be coming out here shortly. So, it's a it's a notification tool. 
we're down to about 10 minutes and I, I did want to right, right when you went no com earlier. Uh, I was asking a question that uh, Josh Malloy had sent early on, and that was about he says it may be beyond the scope of this uh, discussion, but you were talking about the silver standard uh, uh, for certified weather systems. And if, um, if if certified ones are deemed too costly to obtain or maintain, could that be addressed through infrastructure appropriations? So I just wanted to at least well, toss the, it over to you for the there, comments. There actually is, there actually is. And that was, um, uh, it's now allowed for AIP funding to go to uh, the procurement of, of weather systems. The challenge is, is when you, when you do that, you take away from um, the airport itself or the location itself. Uh, you know, whereas AIP funding would be generally, you know, brick and mortar type stuff, you know, building runways, taxiways, fixing things, um, you know, taking a couple million dollars or a million dollars, whatever, whatever the, the dollar amount is for a weather system. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense, especially in, in uh, real remote areas. So, I mean, we're looking at other options. Many people here know we're looking at uh, a low cost option utilizing the weather camera platform called the VWAS. And that is primarily because the fact of the matter is we, we can't continue down the, the lines of installing AWAS everywhere. They, um, we would like something, you know, uh, as good as an AWAS, but it doesn't make sense. So VWAS makes a lot, a lot of sense, but yeah, it, there, so to answer your question, yes, there is a way, a way to get other funding for, for these systems, uh, but unfortunately it robs Peter to pay Paul. Okay, well, thanks, Gordy. Um, any other uh, questions or comments uh, into the chat there? Uh, Dave, this is Matt, and and I don't know if Rob or 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 Lieutenant Colonel Williams are still on the call or not. Rob Branham, that is. Um, but you know, this the, this afternoon's conversation has become uh, very. Um, you know, FAA weather service kind of centric, especially around um, requirements versus recommendations. And I was curious and put a question in chat about how the DOD does that. Do they levy requirements on external or internal weather providers or are they recommendations also? I'd be curious to hear from one of the other of them if they're still on. This is Lieutenant Colonel Branham. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, great. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, from a requirements perspective, we we actually take internal requirements uh, externally uh, outside of Air Force weather, largely from a data perspective through uh, our our partnerships, i.e., through um, something called a uh, COPSI uh network uh from NOAA uh as an example uh you know like for a data feed or in the case of the navy requesting you know data support from air force weather uh, and then uh, i will tell you uh our process it's i don't you know it it, it it runs through our lead command down at Air Combat Command down at Langley Air Force Base, and, and it goes into the requirements process for um, what's called a dot mil PFP analysis, which is basically assessing uh, training, education, operations, and you know the impact of the requirement to the community. And um, ACC will take that lead command and actually. Uh, determine if a materialistic or non-materialistic solution uh, meets the intent of that requirement. So uh, the process can take a little bit of time. It's very thorough, uh, but once it gets into the requirements prioritization process, uh, then we start working with our support program office uh, to look at funding. Uh, that's kind of how the process works. Um, one of the things that we're looking at too right now, and I know Dr. Rao, uh, he just came in after Dr. Farrow recently. He's our new chief scientist uh, for Air Force weather. Uh, he's been involved in a number of meetings uh, and you know, taking a look at you know, how do we 
how do we work with the R2O process? <laughs> and I think that's that's where, um, you know, we're trying to get better at that uh, in the Air Force, if you will, uh, from a, you know, working with a, a, uh, AFRL, Air Force Research Lab, uh, working with Army Research Lab, working with you know, the other academy, you know, uh, the science, you know, community to, to help us uh, do some of those things. I hope that helps, <laughs> helps answer a little bit about the process. <laughs> Matt, Matt, did that um, take care of it? Well, well, I'm embarrassed to say I went to mute myself after um, Colonel Brandon started talking, and when I hit the mute button, Teams folded its tent on me. So I really didn't hear much of what he had to say. <laughs> as long as the rest of y'all did, that's fine. It, it was an excellent answer that went right down the path of what you were looking for. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. It'll take me about an hour and a half to go back over it here real quick. No, just joking. <laughs> um, I, no, no, I, no, I can no, actually no, re. No. Yeah, yeah, I can actually re-speak it to you pretty quickly. Uh, 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 just from a perspective, you know, we have a requirements process. Uh, yes. Um, our lead command, uh, which is Air Combat Command, uh, at Langley Air Force Base manages that. Uh, they work very closely with our support program office, uh, which is up at Hanscom uh, Air Force Base, Massachusetts, um, and, and taking a look at our portfolio of capabilities. Uh, obviously, on the aviation side, a lot of our focus, a lot of our systems uh, on the terrestrial side, really uh, kind of fall, you know, with the weather sensors, you know, of course, at the airfields, uh, both deployed and uh, in garrison. And um, so from a standpoint, um, I think it's important to note that, you know, once we get a requirement uh, submitted, whether it's internally or externally, most of our external requirements are submitted either from the Navy or at times from NOAA through uh, interagency forums such as COPSI. <laughs> that's an example. That's a group that's under uh, the new ICAM structure. Uh, it's a it's an older, longer standing group. Uh, I mean, some of you have probably heard of it, quite frankly. Uh, but uh, that group does a lot of this, a lot of collaboration on data sharing, uh, which I think is another topic we're going to be talking about here in the coming days in this Tim, which I think is important. Uh, but we get that request that comes in and then we actually submit it, uh, we validate it uh, at the Pentagon uh, in our interagency division. We take a look at it uh, from a policy perspective, from a requirements perspective, and then we send it down to our lead command for further analysis. Uh, then it gets put into that process uh, the requirements process of, of prioritization and, and things of that nature. Uh, so that's kind of how we, we process um, all of our requirements. Uh, depending on, um, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's important to note, you know, too, that that's important is, you know, looking at a requirement that that all the agencies, uh, you know, have uh, from a, I mean, from a holistic perspective, I think is important too when, when we look at those. I mean, you know, we take a look at, you know, well, you know, what's NOAA doing with this capability or with this type of requirement? Is there a capability that they're using, uh, you know, currently to to fulfill that, or what's the FAA doing? What's What's the Navy doing? You know, what are our partners, you know, out there using to fulfill such a, you know, such a capability? And I think that's the other, you know, important aspect when we tie this in here. It's not, we don't like using the term solutions when we think of requirements. Uh, it's what capability are we trying to fill? Okay. And it's, it's like somebody today had, had a good conversation, a question. And I think it might have been from Captain Cox uh, from the 15th OWS that spoke earlier today. Uh, it, it's, you know, what are, you know, what's, what's NOAA using up, uh, you know, in the Arctic region uh, as far as, 
you know, modeling capability or, you know, you know, weather forecasting support capability there. Well, we look at capabilities, gaps, and, you know, you know, what needs to be, you know, um, fulfilled, you know, for that particular region, like in the case of that, the, you know, the DAF Arctic strategy, uh, you know, we have a go do from the Secretary of the Air Force to improve weather forecasting capabilities in the Arctic region. Uh, so that's a data gap. I mean, that's a gap that we have currently. And so, you know, how do we get after that? I mean, obviously there's going to be a lot of, a lot of different, you know, different different avenues to uh, to approach that. So I, I hope that answers your question, <laughs> Matt. Um, it did, it did, uh, Rob, thank you very much for taking the time to, to, to do it again and, uh, and, yeah. and bring me back up to speed here. Appreciate it. Yeah, and somebody mentioned in here, I think it might have been Bill that, that talked about an aviation form that, that they have um, for request. We do those too. We have what's called a weather requirements request uh, that our lead command takes. And it's it's a pretty well well built out form. As a matter of fact, I was I was I helped put that together myself when I was down there at A5W uh, a few years ago of, of you know, I kind of had a hand in that, but you know, putting that document together to to justify a requirement, and, and it helps us understand that. And and obviously for us, uh, and too, and I and I'll put a I'll put a foot stomp here on that. When it comes to requirements for the DoD, as you can imagine, uh, if it's tied to the NDS, uh, we're going to have better better luck of getting it funded. Uh, if it's not tied to the NDS, we're going to have a hard time uh, pushing pushing to get money for that. And I presume, and, and sorry for my ignorance, I presume NDS is National Defense Strategy or something like yep. that? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Everything's got to really be aligned with that. Uh, and a matter of fact, we're... we're point to bring up also that uh, we're in the midst right now of uh, doing some revisions for that. So I believe the new one's supposed to be coming out in the next year. Uh, so we're going to be, you know, looking forward to that. And I, I anticipate a lot of climate change coming in that one, uh, mm. just based on the current administration. Uh. Which we'll, I think right. we're going well, to that. Yeah. I'll uh, turn it back to Randy or Matt Matthias. You know, say it's uh, actually a little bit after two, uh, after four, so uh, I think our first day is over with. Um, I want to thank all the uh, all the panelists and and actually everybody who uh, participated today and 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 dialed in. I apologize for uh, uh, some of the technical glitches we had, but I think that's kind of to be expected nowadays with the uh, the sheer number of people we had and uh, trying to do this virtually, but uh, I think overall, overall it went uh, pretty well. Um, I will turn it over to Matt and or Matthias to, uh, to wrap us up and uh, get us prepared for tomorrow. I defer to Matthias. He's, he's much more erudite and well-spoken. <laughs> Well, well, I'm not commenting on that, but I would like to echo Randy's comments and thank all the speakers, all the people who contributed to the stimulating discussions and comments in the chat room and live. Uh, I think this was a good day to uh, create or share or enhance a situational awareness of what's going on across various agencies from an aviation weather uh, perspective. So that's it for today. Uh, I would like to thank also David Strand for uh, expertly shepherding our chat room discussions and questions. This was well appreciated. Thank you, Dave. Looking forward to looking forward to tomorrow. We have another interesting day coming up. This one will be focused on aviation weather for advanced air mobility operations. So this is uh, certainly getting a lot of attention and I expect we have at least as many people participating as today. I noticed we were 
steadily around 100 uh, people dialed in. Uh, sometimes I saw 105 and it was coming and going. So I think overall we had well over 100 different uh, people participate, which was great. That's exactly what we intended with this meeting to get as much participation across different uh, stakeholders. So anyway, thank you again for a good day and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow again. Back to you, Matt. I have nothing to add, Matthias. It was perfect. Thank you, and uh, and everyone. Thank you for being here, and uh, we hope to see you again tomorrow. Bye bye.